In October 2021, I received an email from Rhonda Rabowski, the public relations director of a college in suburban Philadelphia. She wrote in part, last Friday, I received a postcard from the USPS that was postmarked August 18, 1992. I believe it was sent by you to your mother who worked in our department before my time. Everyone is in shock that we got mail 29 years late. I'd love to learn more and get the postcard to the owner. She followed it up with a Facebook post on the college's page. We have a mystery to solve. I offered, her to, put, I offered to put her in touch with my mother, but Rhonda was one step ahead of me. She not only had her information, she had contacted a local news station who wanted to hand deliver the postcard and interview my mother on camera. While I love a taste of fame, I didn't have a great feeling about the way this was going to go. There wasn't anything offensive in the black and white photograph of a so-called mountain woman from Arkansas besides my lame comparison in the opening lines that, in another time and place, this would be you, Mom. <laughs> but this wasn't going to be a feel-good story. You couldn't compare it to one of those letters from World War II you hear about, which finds its way home decades later. Maybe it is full of professions of love from the front, now that either the sender or the recipient have passed away, we are left to wonder about what could have been. No, this postcard expresses fear that my mother's patience, not love, for me has run out, and concern over how different the surfaces of our lives are becoming. From this distance, the writing seems almost prophetic like a cautionary tale that no one listens to. Let me back up. This postcard was sent from the middle of a trip where I hitchhiked across the country as a 23-year-old. Attitudes about hitchhiking in the early 90s inhabited a middle zone of approval between the late 60s and 70s when it was quite common and where it is now when no one in their right mind does it. Just because I had the spirit of adventure, however, didn't mean I knew what I was doing. For my first ride, I stood on a north-south road with a hand-lettered sign that read west. <laughs> Asshole, one driver yelled at me. I ended up covering 4,500 miles of highway, but that wasn't my initial intent. This was the year when the black American Rodney King suffered a vicious unprovoked beating at the hands of white policemen in Los Angeles. When the jury acquitted the officers, riots broke out and caused $1 billion worth of damage amid explosive racial division. I said I was going to help Habitat for Humanity rebuild LA County after the riots. That sounded plausible to my family of socially progressive Jews, never mind the fact that I had no handyman skills. <laughs> At that time, we were only a generation removed from the civil rights movement, when Jewish activists represented a disproportionate number of white people involved in the struggle. My mode of transportation, on the other hand, made no one happy. I wrote up an extensive supply list from an inflatable pillow to instant oatmeal to waterproof matches. I jammed it all into an oversized backpack with my sleeping bag and tent strapped on top and a cook stove, water purifier, and ground cloth hanging off carabiners. My first few rides took me five or 10 miles each. I began to wonder if I was ever going to get to California when my third ride picked me up on the Pennsylvania Turnpike in a plush Chevy truck with an extended cab and drove me a thousand miles to Mount Pleasant, Iowa. 
Rob Williams was a pig medicine salesman who worked as a sheetrocker in his spare time to pick up extra cash. He looked to be in his early 30s, which explained where he got all his energy. He originally told me he was going to Pittsburgh in case he wanted to get rid of me, I later found out. But he came to trust me, so much so that he had me drive while he took a nap. <laughs> Pittsburgh was covered with rain by the time we arrived, and Rob was asleep, and we chugled right through there. I camped out in Rob's spare bedroom for a few days in Iowa, listening to his ideas whenever he wasn't at work. Having served time in the Army, Rob thought that either military service or a stint in the Peace Corps should be mandated for kids right out of college like me. He thought what I was going to do in LA could count, although I was having my doubts about whether it was such a good idea. Just before I left the East Coast, I'd had dinner with an old professor. His wife had told me words that were still ringing in my head. You're going to have a terrible time in LA. They won't care that you're there and you don't know why you're going. <laughs> I asked Rob what he thought. Rob said, 90% of people get lost because they don't go far enough. I hadn't expected to hear such interesting things on the road. During one ride, I went 500 miles out of my way just to hear Al Tingley, who ran the Palmer House Hotel in Sauk Center, Minnesota, keep talking. Al had recently retired as a preacher because the problem with religion was that it won't allow itself to transcend itself. Over cigarettes in his speeding town and country, Al described the divine part of each of us by using the Greek word pisuke. When we vibrate, only certain other people pick up our frequencies, like a tuning fork that resonates. Those are your real friends. And my trip became at least as much about trying to find these people to listen to, who might also want to listen to me. That was what I meant when I wrote in the postcard that this was, quote, a difficult time for us when I am left collecting stories you don't really want to hear. I think my parents really thought I should just listen to them, and that was it. But then I would have missed out on my conversation with Joel Dirksen, a white-haired farmer who picked me up in a crystal blue metallic Ford Ranger. During the course of our ride to Louisville, Kentucky, Joel described a life that was as different from mine as could be, and I don't just mean that his daughters like to race walk. <laughs> I mean, we had different politics. We had different cultures, different religions. We lived in different ecosystems with far different population densities. He didn't care too much for the East Coast and told me he had once visited Washington, D.C., and you can have that rat race. <laughs> When I asked him if I could tent on his property, he made a joke about searching me with a metal detector. And then, despite all our divisions, he seemed to consider things more deeply. Just before he let me sleep in his pasture, along with his 87 cows, he said, if we can't help each other in this world, it's a pretty sad place. This was an important thing to know. This was why staying on the road was better than graduate school, better than choosing the wrong career too quickly. With each of the three dozen rides I got, I could feel my mind opening up wider and wider. And of all the Native Americans and Norwegians who picked me up, the camp counselors and carnival barkers, the individual who made the most sense of anyone was Robert L. Pyant. From Louisville to Little Rock, Robert told me about how 30 years earlier, he was one of the first blacks integrated into the public school system in Gastonia, North Carolina. He described having to sit in the balcony of the theater or in the back of the bus as a colored. Even the washeterias were segregated so blackness wouldn't leave like lint. At the age of 15, Robert decided he wanted to watch a movie from the orchestra level 
or at least as much of it as he could after he slid into the seventh row before the police came. Robert told me about the teachers who were always willing to give him one C to keep him off B honor roll. The guidance counselor who asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? A doctor? A doctor? Heavens, no black folk are doctors. You better be a dentist. That doesn't even make any sense, since <laughs> dentists still have to go to medical school. But the cumulative effect of discrimination meant that Robert gave up on his main dream and now worked in financial services for the medical field. Little Rock would have been a great place to pick up I-40, a straight shot to Southern California, but it was Robert who convinced me not to go to LA after all. He told me that if I was going to help with anything, including racial equality, it was going to be through writing other people's stories. The world doesn't change by people doing good deeds while still thinking the same way. It changes by getting people to listen. After Robert's impactful words, I went to an open mic in Hot Springs, Arkansas, and performed a poem about him that became a staple of the blues and jazz band I met at my next stop in Dallas, and who I performed with as a poet on a tour of Central Europe. Looking back, I don't know if I was among the 90% who got lost, but I don't think it would have been because I didn't go far enough. Apparently in Arkansas, I also wrote and mailed a postcard to my mother. <laughs> I had agreed to drop her a line from time to time to assure her of my safety. We didn't have find my iPhone in those days. That part I remember. I didn't remember how early the communication had broken down between me and my parents for how many decades we had been in essentially the same place we were now until Rhonda Rabowski eventually got her hands on the evidence. Speaking of Rhonda, she emailed me a second time to tell me that she had reached my mother, who was, quote, not agreeable to the news cameras showing up. <laughs> Rhonda was going to mail the postcard to her instead, just happy it would finally reach its destination. She also wrote, as the mother of a teenager myself, I would love to hear how things turned out. I wrote back, my adventures did not throw my parents, as you can gather from both the text and the subtext of the postcard. When I read this, I see there was a lot of love there, even amongst the bewilderment. Then I asked her, when something like this resurfaces, what do you think it means? Is it just one of those flukes, or is it pointing to something? Rhonda never wrote me back. What are we to understand about that? I mean, we'd be guessing, but let's guess. A, she's in PR, and there was no story here, so she lost interest. B, she comes from a family where people like to pretend that everything happens for the best, or that everything is fine, or some such philosophy that didn't permit a response to me. She would have probably been more interested in where the postcard got stuck during its 1,000 mile trek from Little Rock to Philadelphia. What mailbag did it lay at the bottom of? Or perhaps it drifted down in a postal Jeep's trunk to nestle in with the spare tire. But that isn't really the point, Rhonda, if you're still there, <laughs> of why people leave an environment where their thoughts and feelings aren't welcome and why, in the only sense that really matters, sometimes they never return. P.S., the postcard ends, really, Mom, I want to keep rambling, but I have to stop. I'm out of room. Thank you.